13 and 314 for a shooting at Century Theaters. They're saying somebody is shooting in the auditorium. Roger, keep your fires west of the smoke. It's red hot. I had an officer hit. Send me the world. Don't go over that fence. Don't go over that fence. Grab the shotgun again. Welcome to Tactical Tangents. Welcome back to Tactical Tangents. This is Mike. This episode is brought to you by Loa Boots. Start your day off on the right foot with footwear that was designed for those who stand relentlessly in the face of adversity. I wear Loa every single day for miles on canine searches and for hours on tactical operations and inclement weather. No matter what, Loa keeps me moving. Whether you run, hike, hunt, or fight on the streets or out in the woods, Loa has the gear you need to help you conquer whatever challenges you face. Go check out their new line of trail running shoes at Loa Boots, L-O-W-A Boots.com and get outside for some fresh air and daylight. Loa, for those who know where they're going and won't stop until they get there. And this is Jim. This episode is also brought to you by Manisex. We've talked a lot about the tactical fantasy on this podcast and one of the quickest ways to break your tactical fantasies and actually improve your, your performance is by getting real feedback. One of the ways you can do that is with Manisex. You're not going to get better at shooting on your own. You need practice, data, and coaching. And you need to make the most of your ammo with good live and dry fire training. Manus is a family of training devices that tracks you while you train. It times and tracks everything you do in a drill and coaches you as you go. It is indispensable to taking your shooting to the next level. Go find them on manusx.com. A couple of weeks ago, I went to a symposium, a nerdy way of saying like a bunch of people coming together to talk, right? Conference about expo. Yeah. Yeah. at an expo, I picture like tables and people selling stuff. There were a couple tables, but a lot less like selling stuff, more like selling ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, this particular forum or conference or expo, whatever you call it, symposium, uh, was about a regular warfare, which of course is makes my little heart go pitter patter, get all excited about that. And it was cool. I, I learned a lot, and some of the conversations I had were very eye opening, some of them were very unsettling. And one of the themes through that whole conference was it is very clear that we, irregular warriors, feel like uh, we're kind of out there working without a unifying strategy, uh, tying it all, tying the room together, right? And that's messing things up. Like if we all were kind of working from the same playbook, like that would probably help a little bit. And we're good at running plays, but we need someone deciding which plays we need to be running and where we need to be running, right? Uh, And at this symposium, a very smart colleague, uh, who's also very strong, she's going to like the world's strongman competition uh, this week. Um, She was like, Jim, you need to go read this book by one of my professors, The New Rules of War. And the, the author's name is Sean McFate. He's at the National Defense University Smart dude, you know, one of those brains on a stick that we have in in the military complex. And she was like, "Dude, you got to read this book. It's gonna it's gonna be right up your alley." And so I did. Well, I didn't read because I don't know how to read. I just listen to audio books. It's like <laughs> the only way I do books these days. Uh, so I listened to his audio book on my way to and from work, and I was like, oh, "Dude, this is a really smart dude, and uh, he's he gets a lot right." And he's also very, very critical of us, the military, (laughs) and kind of hurts my feelings. Um, Because he talks a lot about how we got really good at tactical employment, right? We can kick anybody's ass in a gunfight or a dogfight, but we got really dumb in strategy. And the fact that we're really dumb in strategy tends to get us in a lot more gunfights and a lot more dogfights than we probably need to. And it gives us a lot less to show for it in the end. All right. We beat them. We shot them. We killed them. We captured them, whatever. Um, and we still feel like we're losing. And I don't know. Maybe, maybe we are. Maybe we're not. Maybe that's our feelings. Maybe that's reality. I don't know. But it got me kind of thinking. And I think this is an interesting topic in a lot of ways. I mean, from my perspective, I'm obviously not thinking necessarily on the scale of big world wars or anything like that, but there's so many layers to it, right? Like there's, there's so many levels of tactics and strategy. Like if you think about kicking someone's ass, 
but then losing the war, right? Like win the battle, lose the war kind of stuff. Uh, there's a lot of parallels in law enforcement. And this was something I actually was just thinking about this last week at one of our training days that we had for my, my team. We were doing like our annual training and annual reps that, that we do for tubular assaults. If you think like school buses or city buses, trains, airplanes, like airliners, those sorts of things. It's like its own kind of unique problem set. It's a tube and you're fighting in it. Right, <laughs> exactly. And so, you know, we're running through the X city SWAT team tubular assault lesson plan like we do every year. And it, it occurred to me that like, how many tactical teams are there in the country? There's something like 18,000 police agencies and not exactly the same number of SWAT teams, but a lot. And I feel like probably every one of those teams has their own spin on tubular assault and probably their own version of every other little thing as well. When it, when it comes to clearing houses or doing hostage rescue, like the tactical team right here in our community next door does things differently than we do. Our federal partners that are local do things differently than, than we do. And we all kind of have our own way. And it's just fascinating to me when we think about strategy and, and the big picture that none of us are really on the same page. Like we haven't all been able to sit down and more or less say like, this is the cheat sheet. This is the code. This is the best way. And granted there's, again, there's layers to it in some places, in some areas, it's going to be different, but it's just fascinating to me that there, that, that no one like, why did my department have to come up with their own way of doing this? That was basically just taken as like folklore from some, probably some FBI dude that was doing it in like the eighties. And that's been trickled down and passed on over the generations to whatever it is now times, however many agencies have their own tactical team. That's just kind of interesting to me. And the other thing is like, not very many of us have ever had to do that in real life. Like that's not a problem that comes up every day. It does happen. The tubular assault problem. It, it's in the, it's in the syllabus somewhere for a reason. Right. But for the most part, the only time most of us will ever use it or employ that is going to be in training. And we only see the success or the failure of those tactics or those techniques or the strategy for it, whatever that is in the confines of the scenarios that we're designing and rehearsing, which were informed by our knowledge of our own tactics. And so I don't know why we haven't been able to have some like big thinkers sit down and examine the last, I don't know, like all five tubular assaults there have been in the last like 30 years or <laughs> it's not very many, I'm sure. Um, and, and give some strategic insight on it. And, and I know like I'm, I'm using the example of one specific tactic, but what I'm trying to do is take that local thing, right? one city police department's tactic on one thing and zoom out times 18,000 agencies. Why is it on a national institutional level? Have we not been able to get on the same page? Well, I'll give you some strategic insight on that. First off, it just doesn't happen that much, right? Like you said, five in the last 30 years. And that's a, that's a swag, but I'm just make a number up. Yeah. I don't know how many there've been but they don't happen enough to justify serious investment of time or operational risk to your SWAT guys in training even uh, to, to practice them every single day. Right. And so how much is enough? Well, the, the str strategy here is you practice it enough that you can create a credible threat to anyone who screws around in a tube. They know some SWAT team somewhere is going to come shoot them in the face. Yeah. That's yeah. the strategy, right? You yeah. do it not to create a credible threat. It's just interesting that it's that everyone has to do it themselves, right? And and if you think bigger picture, just policing in general, right? Those eighteen thousand agencies that I talk about, like we could use active shooter as a as an example of this, right? Active killer programs. You know, we we had uh, Columbine, right? Was was where the latest trends and active killer response started to kind of get popular. Not the first time that's happened, obviously, but where we learned a whole bunch of lessons and we started to, to shift how we did that institutionally. 
or did we? <laughs> At least I thought we did. So it, it became really popular from a strategic, like from the ins at the institutional level that, Hey, this is not a SWAT problem. It's a patrol problem. You have to go in. And I feel like we were all on the same page with that. And then Parkland happened, Uvalde happened, and I don't know, maybe some others. So there, there's another side of this. And when Jim talks about the unifying and guiding strategy, well, it's great when that exists. And, and on some level, when we talk about active killer stuff, it's, it, it does exist on some level. But there's also a contextual implementation side of that. And to Jim's point, does the strategy make us less dumb? <laughs> and that's, it only matters if it makes us less dumb. Hopefully. <laughs> so, uh, so I wanted to put together like an episode about strategy. What should anyone know about strategy? Any door kicker, pilot, uh, cop, SWAT guy, EMT, firefighter. What should you know about strategy? And like that, it's easy to talk military strategy. There's books about that and that kind of thing. Uh, and Mike and I went back and forth like, well, what do you, what do you teach cops about strategy? Like what, how do you apply this? And it does apply. It applies in lots of ways, but I'll just kind of give you some thoughts about this, like tactical versus strategic or tactical wins, strategic losses thing. I believe that cops around the country, when they choose to arrest someone, will almost always affect a successful arrest. When cops around the country, when they get in a gunfight with someone, will almost always win that gunfight. Right? So we are we have tactical overmatch, but do you feel like crime's doing doing well right now in the country. It's, Do you think, it's going great, bud. <laughs> Do you feel safe? Do you feel like your car is not going to get stolen out of your driveway? Business is booming. <laughs> uh, the drug war. We would once again like to congratulate drugs for winning the drug war. <laughs> and that was after tactical win, after tactical win, after tactical win for, for decades and billions of dollars and with with very little show for it and of course you know on the military side holy cow tactical wins and strategic losses korea vietnam iraq afghanistan on and on and on so that that professor guy that wrote the book mcfate in that new rules of war book he says well maybe we need some more strategists and maybe we need to teach everybody including the tacticians to think more strategically hmm strategery hmm Okay, cool. Except in 20 plus years of the military, I can count on maybe one hand the number of truly strategic thinkers I've met. Ooh, that's tough. Also, I'm not entirely sure most people in the military can explain what it even means to think strategically. And when you ask them, you tend to get stupid bumper sticker answers like, hope is not a strategy. Okay, great. What is a strategy? Dang. Or keep it simple, stupid. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> you Sun Tzu. Or it's like football. You get stuff like that. Uh, so like, what the hell is a strategy? And of course, it's easy for me to complain about those people. And as I was sitting thinking about what we want to talk about in this episode, I was like, uh, I'm not sure I could explain strategy. I should probably go get smart on this stuff. So, I, you know, I reached out to some buddies and, you know, what is strategy? Words mean things. The word strategy means different things in different contexts. And like I said, I'm, I'm not a strategist. I don't think strategically most of the time. There's a reason this podcast is called Tactical Tangents, because that's the fun stuff to me. <laughs> so I'm, I'm thinking, and I, I reached out to my buddies, much smarter people, strategy nerds across the government and across academia, and I'm like, guys, what the hell is strategy? <laughs> and and then how do I explain it in a way that matters to door kickers? And so they, uh, to their credit, because they're, they're talkers, a lot of them sent me a bunch of ideas. So I stole a bunch of ideas and we're presenting them. I want to caveat up front. None of these are mine. <laughs> I stole this from all kinds of different places and we'll cite them wherever we can in the show notes, that kind of thing. But but there, there are a lot of ideas here and a lot of years of serious academic work went into this, but we're going to try to synthesize and analyze it into a way that means something to you, the practitioner. So that's my hope. All right. So what is strategy? 
uh, you crack open Sun Tzu, the art of war, and you see all these little fortune cookie things like, oh, know your enemy and know yourself and you will win a million battles. Okay, great. Cool. Good. Um, know the terrain and you will win a million more battles. Okay, cool. Terrain, know the enemy, intel matters. Okay, cool. Uh, the best way to win is not fighting. Okay, but what if I'm in a fight? What do I do then? Right. <laughs> uh, so hmm, maybe we need to go past Sun Tzu, or maybe we need to read a bunch of other stuff so that we understand what we're reading in Sun Tzu, maybe. Um, one way of looking at strategy, the easy way, I would say, is think of it as a matter of scale. And not always scale like geographic size. Sometimes it's the scale of time or the scale of people. So traditionally in the military, we think the tactical level, the operational level, and the strategic level. Tactical level is the level at which individuals or small groups of individuals are fighting other individuals or small groups. Operational is when you have groups of groups fighting. And strategic is like, big geopolitical groups of nations fighting. That's one way of looking at it. And it's often how I use it here on this podcast. It's also super incomplete and actually quite wrong. And one of the tricky parts about being smart is keeping a bunch of different ideas in your head at the same time without going crazy. So one way of looking at strategy is scale, right? Big picture, long-term, lots of people, lots of agencies strategy cool that's one way there's a related another related way to look at this that i think about which is if you think about tactics tactics and techniques the way you would clear a room or clear a a, a building or a school and then there's like the doctrine or the principles so the difference between tactics or techniques and then also doctrine or principles. So if you look at the doctrine of active killer response, fundamentally, we understand that we need to close with and kill the bad guy. Stop the killing, stop the dying. Okay, that sounds like a great strategy. Uh, How do I do that? And that's where you have to get down into the weeds when it comes to tactics and techniques, especially if it's something like I'm doing solo room clearing, right? Usually you teach people how to clear buildings and it's, it involves more than one person, but with an active killer scenario, you might be by yourself. And so we need new tactics and techniques to deal with a more unique problem. All right. So those are the tactics and techniques. So now you could talk a little bit more um, operationally about things like in the, in the realm of active killer response, rescue task force. How do we deal with integrating Um, resources, fire and police, for example, and EMS. Uh, How do we deal with incident command structure and uh, stuff like that? So we have some framework, right? When it comes to what the strategy looks like, and it's easy to feed lip service to that and be like, oh, well, stop the killing, stop the dying. All right, cool. But we still have to deal how to, we still have to figure out how to deal with the limited resources of a mass casualty event and the fog and friction of an active killer event. And Jim also mentioned scaling the problem, right? And people, geography, and time. Think about how all of the challenges associated with that sort of thing change if you are in a small town with fewer resources versus a major metropolitan area. That Those problems become very different very quickly. So scale has a role in this, but... If you only see strategy as a scale and only see tactics as a scale, you're missing a huge part of the problem, right? Another way and probably a better way of looking at it is strategy is designing and planning to gain advantage. Now, think of like companies. Companies have business strategies and growth strategies and people strategies and marketing strategies. I'm not sure all of those are actually true strategies, but they call them that because they're thinking about planning to gain advantage. Lawyers develop a legal strategy for trying a case. Politicians have strategies for their campaigns. Skilled chess players have a strategy for each game and tournament. Football coaches have strategies for each game and season. Uh, Well, the general manager has a long-term strategy for the team as a whole. And a lot of that's talent management, right? Defining strategy by scale misses a lot. 
and especially in terms of differing it from operations and tactics. So thinking of it in, in this sense of planning and designing to gain advantage, consider tactics, when you really get down to it, they're algorithms. If this, then this, right? Think like a computer program. Algorithms for solving known, generally well-defined, or at least well-understood problems that you're going to commonly encounter in a given field. Like in the military, I need to go into this room. There might be enemies in there. That's a common, well-defined, well-understood problem. Therefore, the Army and the Marines, they have tactics for entering and clearing rooms. Mike's SWAT team has tactics for entering and clearing rooms. <laughs> and it's, it's tempting to be like, well, our strategy is standardizing tactics across the force. Yeah, it's also not where we're going, right? So it's, it's tricky. Um, tactics themselves are a set of specific techniques and procedures uh, that can be like shared and overlapped with other tactics, right? That's TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures, okay? So think, when I talk tactics in this context, think algorithms, checklists, operations. Operations can be your day-to-day -day activities, the things that you're doing to pursue well-defined missions and goals. I have an end state. I'm going after it doing this thing today, right? Potentially in a very complicated but understandable context, right? We're going to send our cops out into the city in these ops divisions, and they're going to enforce the law and respond to calls. That's what we're doing today to make Winslow, Arizona, a safer place to live. <laughs> I'm always trying to come up with other places in the Southwest. <laughs> Winslow. Winslow. Shout out to our friends in Winslow. That's right. Um, so like that's b battles happen at the operational level. Training plans happen at the operational level. Deployment cycles, planning processes, your logistics are typically an operational level thing. Operations are how we build, manage, and sustain the resources and capabilities that we're going to need to, to do the mission using our TTPs. Okay. Now, strategy. Whew. That's a lot of preamble for what the hell is strategy. Strategy is your plan to get from your current state to a desired end state with your available resources in the face of uncertainty ambiguity, conflicting interests, which include enemies, allies, other stakeholders, and all their priorities and plans. So you can't do this in a vacuum, right? The, the other guys get a vote. And not just the enemy. Freaking everybody gets a vote. And that's one of the things that makes this hard. So I got some quotations from some smart people. A plan supposes a sequence of events that allows one to move with confidence from one state of affairs to another. Strategy is required when others might frustrate one's plans because they have a different and possibly opposing interests and concerns. The inherent unpredictability of human affairs due to the chance events, as well as the efforts of opponents and the missteps of friends, provides strategy with its challenge and drama. <laughs> that was from Sir Lawrence Friedman, Strategy, A History. I love the end drama. <laughs> <laughs> true. <laughs> it, that, true. No, for real. Yeah. It, especially when you talk about like the unpredictability of human affairs, everyone, like like you said, everyone gets a vote. And even, yeah. on, even on the same team, like reasonable minds differ. And so there's yeah. plays into it for sure. Like think about our allies. Think about who our allies were in like World War II. Do you think that they were always really locked up with us or that we were always really locked up with them? Maybe not, but we had to get there, right? For D-Day to work, we had to get there. Uh, next one. Strategy can be defined as the determination of the basic long-term goals and objectives of an enterprise and the adoption of courses of action and the allocation of resources necessary for carrying out those goals. That's Alfred D. Chandler, uh, strategy and structure. I like that. That's actually pretty straightforward, and clean cut. And I can work with that. So long-term goals, objectives, and the adoption of courses of action and the allocation of resources to get there. Okay, cool. I can work with that. I think even, even military people can work with that. 
cool. Uh, so those three levels nest into each other, like one of them, like nesting dolls, babushka dolls, whatever you called. Uh, but not necessarily just in terms of scale. Scale's there, but that's not really the dominant thing. Strategy determines the appropriate tactics available, right? Your list of available options is set by your strategy and how they're put together in the effort to achieve your strategic goals. So which tactics am I willing to employ, right? There are a lot of tactics police could employ that would work, but <laughs> may not get you what you want. Well, like a uh, classic strategy example is like nukes, right? Like, oh yeah, they'll, <laughs> they'll accomplish some things. <laughs> Might not yeah. be the things that you want. So yeah. like largely we take that off the table and it just becomes a deterrence, right? Um, operations are the essential link between the two, between tactics and strategy, uh, by ensuring those charged with tactical execution have resources and capabilities to execute successfully. Um, and strategic planning itself, like the act of doing the planning, is an operational process, certainly the military side. Uh, so, traditional strategy game, chess, you might have heard of it. Um, a strategy in chess is a player's plan for using his or her pieces to checkmate the opponent's king, right? It, that strategy provides guiding principles that help them pick their specific tactics. If I know my opponent is going to use uh, their opening to build a strong defense before they go on attack, I might use a real aggressive strategy with early attacks to screw up their defense, right? Right creating openings for my pieces to go after the king before he's ready for me. The specific moves and combinations I choose, those are my tactics. And my operations uh, might be that background preparation that I do before the game to like set me up for success. Maybe I do a little studying. Maybe I watch some game tapes. Maybe I steal his playbook. If you ain't cheating, you ain't trying, right? Um. In a national security context, strategy has to, we need it to, unify our efforts across time. Now, this is tricky because every four years we get a chance at a new president. And sometimes those presidents don't agree. You might have noticed that in the last couple of years. That sometimes you get one that really doesn't agree with the last one. <laughs> Do you think that ever causes some drama <laughs> in national security? <laughs> yes or shifts our priorities or our resources? Yes, right? So a good national security strategy should work across time. It should work across multiple presidential administrations and across our whole of government. So not just across time, but across the military, the intelligence community, the Department of Agriculture, Congress. We need to get everybody kind of on board with how we're gonna do things, right? It also has to harmonize harmonize our elements of national power. And the traditional way of thinking about that is dime, right? Diplomatic information, military, economic. And the current U.S. national security strategy talks a lot about, hey, we've been using the M, the military, a whole lot in the last 20, 30, <laughs> 50, 70 years. And maybe that hasn't gotten us everywhere we wanted. So maybe it's time to use the D, the I, and the E. Cool. Can't wait to see us actually do it, but cool. Um, so the D, the dime are like the levers we can pull to move things the way we want to move them. They're the elements of national power. So where the rubber meets the road on that, having a unified strategy is it doesn't work to have the CIA trying to recruit a guy to spy for us and have the FBI try to arrest that same guy or the State Department throw up parade for him that same week all while SOCOM is trying to shoot that guy in the face you need someone to kind of unify the effort and harmonize the effort sounds easy isn't and in the military context I can tell you the Air Force traditionally kind of struggled with this whole thing uh, the term strategy because organizationally we had a strategic air command and that command SAC owned all our nuclear bombers. We also had a tactical air command, TAC, and it owned all of our fighters. So to the Air Force for, for decades, an embarrassingly long time, 
Uh, if it was a nuclear item or a bomber, it was strategic. And if it was a zippy little jet fighter, it was tactical. But what happens when your jet fighter shoots down the enemy president's airplane all while flying across an operational space? Uh Uh-oh, divide by zero, right? You might have a tactical airplane, have it with a strategic impact. Fighters and bombers use tactics to execute strategies. So thank goodness we moved away from TAC and SAC to at least something that just conceptually makes more sense. So anytime we talk strategy, somebody somewhere has written an official military book about it. Uh, there's absolutely a bunch of official military books about strategy. Uh, joint publication one TAC zero two defines strategy as the art and science of developing and employing instruments of national power in a synchronized and integrated fashion to achieve theater national and or multinational objectives. Cool. That is the definition. Words, words, words. I don't have a big gripe with that, right? The the art and science. Okay, cool. It's not just ones and zeros. Cool. Um, Developing and employing instruments of national power. So I have to create power. Okay, cool. Uh, And I have to synchronize and integrate that. Uh, We talked about that. Okay, that's true. Um, To achieve objectives. Also true. All that's true is just not real helpful, right? When you just see that sentence, you're like, okay, great. That's strategy. Cool. A lot of words, words, words. Um, But if we're being honest, most of your time in your job, whatever your job is, uh, it probably never mattered, honestly, right? Most of the time in whatever job you have, pick a job. I'm a firefighter. I'm a plumber. I'm a F-16 pilot. I'm a cop. Most of the time, you're treated like a bricklayer, right? Man this post, answer these emails, respond to these calls, turn this wrench. See that fire? Put the water <laughs> on the fire. Yes. Apply this algorithm to this problem. That's tactics, right? You got a problem, you got an algorithm, do the thing. As you move up, you might do a little bit more organizing, running several people, all applying algorithms, you know, operationalizing your tactics. What I'm asking you to do is think a little bit less like a bricklayer and think a little bit more like an architect. How do you consider your goals, your resources, your environment to decide which algorithms and which resources to bring to bear? and which algorithms and which resources you need to make more of or better, okay? And it's important because strategy is what makes sure your tactical excellence and your guy's tactical excellence doesn't go to waste. So that is your plan to use tactics to contribute to continuing advantage or at the very least slow down disaster in an infinite game. And note that I said game games and board games come up a lot when we talk strategy. Games are a way of learning and modeling and understanding strategy. And any analogy, any metaphor, if you take it too far, is going to lose meaning, right? Uh, But you can truly learn a lot about strategy from games like chess or Risk or Go. And even like some of the video games, Warcraft, I never played it, but I understand it's uh, it is a strategy game. Also note that I said infinite game. When we talk strategy, we talk end state a lot. But that's deceptive. (laughs) And this is an area where it really messes up military guys. Because we have a goal, we're going to go after that goal, right? We're goal-oriented people. Uh, But in national security, there is no such thing as an end state. So even though we talk about end state a lot... um, doesn't really exist. It's not a static thing, right? Life, static. life and time go on. Yeah. This isn't a goddamn fairy tale. There is no happily ever after. There is always a next chapter. Okay. You won that. Guess what? It's the other guy's turn now. 
or maybe you don't let them take a turn. You just keep going after them. Yeah, I mean, people let their guard down and they get complacent and things change. I mean, there's a lot of things. And this is a good, important point, even on the stupid Mike is just a cop, lower level stuff, right? Like when I think about some of the tactics, quote unquote, strategy, when it comes to policing, we make a lot of assumptions, right? Like if you think about what your instate's going to be, and I'll go back to my tubular assault example, since it doesn't happen very often, we don't get a whole lot of real world experience. We're working in a, in this kind of fairy tale sort of land where everything is in theory, right? In theory, that doesn't, that doesn't help a whole lot because we don't get to really like test it. The only place that we test anything is when we train and practice it. And, and like I said earlier, that's in the confines of what we think, how we think this is going to go down. It's all biased in the context of our own assumptions. So when we're thinking about stuff like this, you really have to challenge your assumptions. You have to know that whatever you think is the end state right? The enemy gets a vote. And like Jim said earlier, everyone else gets a vote too. There's a lot more involved here. And a lot of those elements are out of your control. So you can, what if it, you can have contingencies, you can try to, you know, strategize the what ifs, right? The unintended consequences, the, you know, what you think is going to be the end state and what incremental places you might get. But one of the big things that you have to focus on there is adaptability, and making sure that you can keep up with changes, right? The tempo or the rate of change in your environment. Yeah, that in itself is an important strategic thing is I'm going to adapt faster than the other guy, right? That's a good doctrine that should drive a lot of your strategies. Choose courses of action that improve your options later, okay? There are good reasons why so few people get good at this stuff. Strategy is hard and strategic thinking is hard. It is intellectually tough for our little ape brains to think long-term, large scale, and incorporate all the variables through multiple plays. But it isn't magic either, and it's not impossible. You're not too dumb to understand this. Uh, start with what you're trying to accomplish. Think about what you're willing to risk to get it. What are you willing to lose to get it? What resources do you have? What resources do you need to develop? Uh, one kind of a quick way to start working on this is SWOT, S-W-O-T. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. You just draw that out on a quad chart, and it starts getting you down this path. So... You know, military love strategy, at least we love thinking we love strategy. Uh, we've spent a lot of time and effort on this as a military. And probably the best effort that I've seen on understanding strategy is a book called Strategic Theory for the 21st Century. <laughs> the little book on big strategy, and it was produced by the Army War College. When I say little book, I'm pretty sure it's like 136 pages. That's, that's little, kind of. Um but I'm not going to read 136 pages to you on a podcast. What I can do is I can give you the, the Cliff's notes. They listed out, and this is one of the most army things I can imagine, 15 premises of strategic thinking, like their baseline for how they want army officers to think about strategy. Then there will be a quiz at the end, so pay attention. Quizzes, take notes. <laughs> I'm just going to read them off. You got this. The first premise of a theory of strategy is that strategy is proactive and anticipatory, but not predictive. Well, what the hell does that mean? Okay, proactive anticipatory. I got to worry about the future. That's what that is. Not predictive. I can make whatever strategy I want. The future gets a vote, right? I don't get to predict the future. I think that's useful. A second premise is that political purpose dominates all strategy. Right, War is politics by other means. That's Clausewitz. Politics is going to drive your train, at least in the military. A third premise is that strategy is subordinate to the nature of the strategic environment, as in the world around you is going to drive a lot of what you got to figure out here. Okay, You don't get to pick your environment. You, you don't get to pick you know, what you're walking into. 
A fourth premise is that strategy is holistic in outlook. It demands comprehensive consideration. We're going to get into that as we go, but like, I hate the word holistic. I give Mike crap every time he uses the word holistic on the podcast, but this is an area where it's, it's a big deal. Whole of situation, totality of circumstances. You got to consider as many variables as you can. A fifth premise is that any strategy creates a security dilemma for the strategist and the other actors. So any strategy is going to cause dilemmas for you and the other guy. And writing uh, it down means it can get found. Yeah. And a big saying in soft is you always want to put the other guy in the horns of a dilemma. You want to throw him on the bull of a dilemma. Okay. A sixth premise is <laughs> that strategy got 10 is more guys. It's going to be great. <laughs> Oh, we're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> is that strategy is grounded in uh, what is to be accomplished and why it is to be accomplished. Strategy cannot be formulated in a policy or intellectual vacuum. The strategist has to know the end state he's trying to achieve, which is funny because the game never ends. <laughs> you got to keep those two ideas in your head. End state and also there is no end state. There is no spoon. Just accept it. That's strategy. Okay. A seventh premise is that strategy is an inherently human enterprise. People are dealing with hardware. Yeah. Pink, squishy humans. Pink, squishy humans have feelings and narratives like their way of looking at the world. Agendas. You can, you can occupy Gaza, but do you think that's going to make all the Palestinians go away? Probably not. Right. An eighth premise is that friction is, is an inherent part of strategy. Friction is the difference between the ideal strategy and the applied strategy. It's the drama. How it's supposed to work versus how it actually unfolds. Like, there's always going to be Murphy's Law. Murphy always gets a vote. Okay? A ninth premise is that strategy focuses on root causes and purposes. So you got to understand the why. You have to understand the why like five levels deep. You got to understand the why. A tenth premise is that strategy is hierarchical. Political leadership ensures and maintains its control and influence over the instruments of power through hierarchical nature of straight state strategy. What that means, there's a couple different ways of looking at that, but basically take China. The Communist Party of China is interested in preserving the Communist Party of China. As far as they're concerned, without them, there is no China. And their military exists to keep them where they are. Vladimir Putin, as far as he's concerned, if there's no Putin, there's no Russia. His whole apparatus is there to keep him in power. Okay. An 11th premise of strategic theory is that strategy has a symbiotic relationship with time. Key component of strategic competency is thinking in time, the ability to foresee continuity of strategic choices with the past and the consequences of their both intended and unintended effects in the future. You got to think second and third order effects, right? I might spray, what is it, DDT and get rid of all the mosquitoes, but if I do, I kill all the bald eagles, right? You got to think two and three layers deep when you're making a strategy. That's hard. A 12th premise is that strategy is cumulative. Effects in the strategic environment are cumulative. Once enacted, they become part of the play of continuity and change, right? Every turn is successive. A 13th premise is that the efficiency is subordinate to effectiveness and strategy. doesn't matter how efficient you are. If your stuff doesn't work, it doesn't work. A 14th premise is that strategy provides a proper relationship or balance among the objectives sought. So you might have several goals, but you have to figure out which goal beats the other goals. You got to prioritize, right? A 15th and final premise, thank God, <laughs> of strategy is that risk is inherent in all activity. The best we can do is seriously consider the risks involved, producing favorable balance against favor, uh, excuse me, against failure. What risks are you willing to take? What risks are you not willing to take? That is a huge deal in strategy. Whew. All right. That was 15, 15 premises. And like, 
I, again, I, there's goodness there. And if you ever want to deep dive that, go find the book that it's out of. And it's, again, you can you can download it for free. It's from the Army War College and just uh, search for strategic theory in the 21st century, the little book on big strategy. Now, I asked some some of my smart buddies about you know strategy and what what our audience should know and they said you know two or three people mentioned you know amateurs talk tactics pro professionals talk logistics and strategy which is true it's a it's a long saying uh or long standing saying it's been around forever it's also kind of dumb well maybe not dumb but uh it's not real helpful it gets interpreted in such a way that like tactics are considered less than not as important as strategy or logistics. And that just doesn't work. Yeah, you, you really do have to think about all of that. And I'll go, I'll use my active killer example again, because you mentioned the logistics problem. Like the tactical side of that problem is significant when you consider that, hey, this isn't the kind of thing we're going to contain it, surround it, call a SWAT team. Like there is a tactical issue where we need guys to, to, to get in there, right? Okay, that's a, that's a tactics thing. Easy enough. Fine with and kill the guy. Or fine close with and kill the guy. Perfect. We need to get that part right. But when you think about mass casualty events and just major incidents in general, like these are a significant resource and logistics problems inherent in those things. You have to think about like, well, how many ambulances do I even have? And where where do I staff those things? Uh, and also like parking, <laughs> Like, like the parking thing becomes a problem. And then radio channels and communications. How do I get everyone, when I start calling all these other agencies over, how do we talk to each other? Um, There's big challenges in that, right? And so it's easy to be like, oh, you know, tactics is, you know, just nothing. Well, no, those matter, right? That's where the the killing and the dying is, is going to hopefully stop is somewhere in the tactics. But, and again, we understand kind of the, the big picture strategy, quote unquote, but there's still a logistics issue, right? And like, you have to tie all that together for it to work. That's a great point. And I would tack on uh, that with, with strategy, you're also figuring out where to put your effort and where to put your resources, right? Into teaching cops. Is that, is that where I need to, to really think is teach all the cops how to handle this really, really well. Or do I put all my effort in teaching the teachers how to handle it? Uh, do I assign someone full time to assess risks at schools? As in, hey, Johnny said something that we were uncomfortable with. Um, we're going to put an officer on that or five officers on that. Um, on the ambulance thing. When a city or a county or who, whoever runs your ambulances is deciding how many ambulances to have, how many to fund, they're making a strategic decision. They're making a risk decision. If I only have one ambulance in that city, because most days that's all I need, they're accepting a risk on behalf of your kids that they're not going to need five ambulances that day. That's a strategic decision. That's a resources decision. And that is where you need to apply some strategy. So say, for example, you have a $10,000 grant and it's specifically to spend on active shooter preparedness. What do you spend it on? Do you spend it on tourniquets for every classroom? Cameras or connecting those cameras in such a way that arriving cops can see what's on them? Do you spend it on patrol rifles to, to do engagement? If I got $10,000, what do I spend that $10,000 on? If I've got armed police, um, school resource officers, where do I put them? Say I've got one or two in the district. Do I put them at the high school? Do I put them at the junior high? And then as far as the tactics go, like run, hide, fight, that's a tactic. That's an algorithm that I want everybody in an active shooter to apply, right? Applying a tourniquet to stop major bleeding in an arm or leg is a tactic. Um, when the cops show up and they Leroy Jenkins to the sound of shots, that's a tactic that we develop post-Columbine, right? We don't wait around, we go. You re respond to the stimulus. On the other hand, like time is lives, that's a doctrine that drives all those other tactics. It's an idea. So what are some strategies that could turn the tables? 
well, let's think. What are some strategies that would allow us to turn the tables on active shooters? Well, we could put a ton of time and attention and money into hardening schools, right? Set them up like prisons so you can control every single door from a central point. We could do that. We could teach first aid to every single public school student in the country. We could accept the risks as they are, knowing that we are sacrificing however many kids per year to active shooters. We could assign an armed police officer to every single classroom in the country. We could ban all guns and go door to door taking away existing guns. <laughs> hey, I didn't say I like any of these strategies, but they are in fact strategies. Right? <laughs> Let me know how that works out for you. <laughs> we could try that, right? Let me know how it works out. <laughs> Similarly, when you think about a city or a town, Jim mentioned the ambulances thing, and it's no different. Like if I have 400 cops and I've got to distribute these 400 cops around the city. 24 7 365 like how do i deploy those guys and if i have 20 cops working in a certain area at one time but then a major event absorbs all of them like how do you deal with that secondary attack like the next wave right the staffing and logistics and resources problem that comes with strategy and like people scoff at like administration and budgets and money and budget cuts this is like there's strategic implications in all of that. Like, how do I get the money and the funding and the resources and the support and the votes and the right people in office or whatever to accomplish some of these things? Hopefully, when it comes to that sort of problem and your resources start getting drained for this event, you've got your tacticians that are out there kicking the doors and your operational leaders that are managing that problem. But hopefully there is some forward thinker that has been on the sidelines or in the background considering who am I going to call for help? How am I going to get extra people here? Right. The, the tactical solutions are great, but that strategic understanding is also relevant. You have to plan for that stuff. You have to tie it in. Yeah. Professionals have to talk about every level, right? We have to talk about tactics and logistics and strategy and ops. We got to be able to do it all. A strategy without a way to turn it into tactical reality is a bar napkin with lines and arrows on it. Great. Good job. Logistics without people on both ends of the supply chain is just a supply chain. It's a concept. You need factories, materials, research and development on one end of it. Oh, and money. And on the other end of it, you need able brains and able bodies uh, at the end of the supply chain to shoot the bullets and eat the beans, right? And if you don't have enough money, this is going to be a problem. Uh, so among those other things like professional stock logistics, well, you also need to talk budget. Show me your budget and I'll tell you what your priorities really are. That's a, a common saying in DC. Uh, so are you putting all your money in stealth fighters? Well, that's cool if you're going to use stealth fighters in the next fight. But that said about like professional stock strategy, there is something kind of overarching about strategy strategy by nature has to be holistic. And I mean, truly holistic. It has to take into account economics, resources, culture, psychology, attitudes, politics. It has to coordinate, harmonize, prioritize actions. There's a lot there. So there's a great article about this called the nonsense of amateur study tactics and pro stock logistics. Uh, the dude's name is ML Kavanaugh, and we'll link to it in the show notes. It is worth checking out just to kind of help help guide that discussion about how seriously do we take logistics versus tactics versus strategy. And like I said, truly holistic or all the variables. I want you to think about what that really means. Strategy isn't just complicated. It's complex. Yeah, you know, words mean things, don't they? Dang. Yeah. Have you ever considered Yeah, have you ever considered the difference between complicated and complex? And that's not just a funny English languageism. Think about like a 747 jet. That's complicated. It's got lots of moving parts. 
lots of switches, lights and knobs, you know, suck, squeeze, bang, blow through the engine or all four engines, but it is fundamentally a finite and closed system. You can build a 747. Might take you a long time, but you could do it. <laughs> you could build a hundred of them. You could fly a 747. You could control one. You could troubleshoot one. Some of our tactics and our operations are complicated. You got a lot of moving parts, but strategy is complex. Complex is less knowable. It is much more complicated, right? Like Congress. Congress, <laughs> oh boy. Or many of the women I've dated over the course of my life, uh, you know, may have only so many members, but the dynamics are complex. You can't just build Congress or repeat it or always predict it. You could try to model it, you can understand chunks of it, but no, like, no one really understands Congress. And think about that in the national security context. Think about the Middle East. Do you think anybody really freaking understands the Middle East? No, not even a little bit, right? Yeah, I mean, just trying to contain the Middle East in one box. I mean, you're still talking about several cultures and several countries, and it's a there's a lot to it. And I think this is an interesting point that I haven't thought much about necessarily in these terms, but the complexity piece is like there's overlapping variables, right? Things can be happening parallel to each other that you don't know how they're going to affect each other down, you know, in a, in a minute, right? Further down the timeline complicated, like, yeah, maybe you could map it out. It might be a big map, but you can map it out complex. There's things that you can't predict. And I like the Congress example because there's the things that people say in front of the cameras or on the floor and then there's the backdoor meetings and the handshakes and what happens at happy hour. And um, there is, I was talking to someone very, very smart that I know about support of law enforcement in general. And there's people out there, this is one of the th themes that came up is there's a lot of people out there that generally support the police, but they don't want to be super public about how much they support the police. So they're not going to give any money to like a police union, but they'll give money to an organization that might otherwise support the police in other ways. Okay. <laughs> like, so it's complex, right? It's, it's, it's difficult. Right. And the other topic that we were, we were discussing when it relates to this is police leaders might really be supportive of doing police work, doing, being proactive, kicking in doors, chasing down bad guys, but they might have to dance around that a little bit in the public eye. And so, how how do you want to um, win the hearts and minds, right? Like there's some salesmanship that goes into that and how you accomplish those things and garner that support. You can't map that out really, right? It's a long ongoing thing. So I, I really like the complex versus complicated thing. Uh, when we talk about clearing schools, okay, that's complicated. Right. Like I could, there's lots of angles, there's manpower, there's all those things, but complex public relations, different beast. right? You don't know how people might respond to a certain thing that you say. Once you make a statement, maybe people accept it and they move on. Maybe there's parts of it that you think, yeah, they won't like, but I can defend it. Maybe there's a riot, <laughs> like who knows, <laughs> right? That's the problem. And, and, and consider that in the context of like crime in a neighborhood, Parts of that might be comp. Parts of it might be really simple. There might just be one asshole in the neighborhood. Uh, it might get real complex or crime across a state or the cartels, right? That might get real complex pretty quickly. Um, there's another problem here, which is when you're a practitioner, when you're a police officer or a captain in the army uh, or a sergeant or a private or a corporal uh you have very little say in overall strategy in fact i would argue maybe you have no say right we don't pay privates or lieutenants for their grand strategy ideas uh but that doesn't mean you get to ignore it just because you can't control it doesn't mean you could ignore it everything you do impacts the strategic board yeah i mean <laughs> You you kind of get a say, right? <laughs> like everyone, every practitioner kind of gets a say, uh, 
if some dumbass in whatever town USA throws a flashbang into a baby's crib, just hypothetically, if that was a thing to happen, like, or someone kneels on some guy's neck for 27 minutes or whatever, and that guy dies, again, throwing hypotheticals out there, like, we're all going to pay the st- strategic price for that. And in a lot of cases, that could mean that now every team across the country loses flashbangs. Like, we don't have that as a tool. Or... Maybe there's some political intervention to ban otherwise viable techniques that someone ruined for the rest of us. There's chokeholds are a good example of this, right? There's a couple couple of events where chokeholds got a little sideways and someone died. Now, was the chokehold the problem? Yeah, that's up for debate. And there's a proficiency component to that, right? Like you have to do them correctly and, and blah, blah, blah. I'm not advocating for or against that here and now because there's some investment to make there, but... If you consider that people doing jujitsu for sport get choked out all the time and it's not really that big of a deal, right, compared to the other types of uses of force that might escalate if we did something else, like shoot somebody, um, a couple people misused it. And now it's not a good look and we can't – it's been taken off the table. So, yeah, practitioners still get a vote. <laughs> Uh, it's just not necessarily the one that we intended or hoped for a, a lot of times. Yeah. So the term of art for this concept is the strategic corporal. And that was coined, as far as I know, by General Krulak. He was the commandant of the Marine Corps. And he wrote an article about the strategic corporal saying, hey, I need my fielded forces to understand the strategic picture. Uh, and I need them to be adaptable so they can fight that three block war where they are doing peacekeeping in one block and then they move the next block down the road and all of a sudden they're shifting gears and they're uh, peace enforcing, right? Creating a presence, a menace. And then in the next block, they're in a full on gunfight and they need to understand if they do the wrong thing in any of those, they can trigger a cascading strategic impact, maybe a negative, maybe positive, but you have to understand your impact, especially in the 21st century where there's cameras on you and social media and information warfare going on in the background. What you do will be seen by the world and will have cumulative effects on the whole war, right? Classic examples, Abu Ghraib in Iraq. Uh, like five relatively low-level uh, enlisted troops who were poorly supervised by their officers and NCOs uh, got us a cascading problem in terms of how we were seen by the locals. One example on the positive side, there is a dude named Captain Travis Patrickwin, a um, true American hero. Uh, he was in Iraq about the time that was going on, and he, uh, he got fed up with how things were going in one particular chunk of Iraq, specifically the Anbar province. And he kind of figured it out. He was like, hey, we're doing this wrong. And he kept trying to explain it to people, and he realized that colonels and generals are sometimes kind of dumb, right? Like they, they know what they know, they know it really well, but taking new ideas is sometimes hard for them. Uh, so he actually made a cartoon slideshow that even a general could understand, um, explaining his idea for how to win an Anbar Iraq. And it was things like, we shouldn't be using a national police force that doesn't know the local population because. They don't know the locals any better than we do. They're Iraqi, but they don't know neighborhood to neighborhood who the who the good guys are and who are who they aren't. He also said, "Hey, maybe we should grow mustaches because they don't re- trust you or respect you if you don't have a mustache." <laughs> um, which we we've done other episodes about. So his slides are in the show notes. I highly recommend it because he's they're a great example of how one practitioner, one captain, relatively low level dude who thinks strategically can drive a strategic outcome. And he is credited personally with fixing a lot of the problems in Anbar, Iraq that later um, moved across all of Iraq between about 2008, 2010 timeframe. They're also funny as shit. Like if you ever get a chance, like seriously, go find his slides. They're great. We'll link to them. Uh, There's another problem here. Lots of problems in strategy. (laughs) Uh, <clears throat> that strategists, at least in my experience, often aren't great communicators. Travis Patrickwin was an exception. He was great at it. Uh, 
but more often they tend to be kind of nerdy and academic. They have to account for so many variables that they often hedge what they're saying. So they sound kind of fortune cookie ish or horoscopy. Um, and there's a stereotype that they're kind of the nerds in the back corner somewhere like playing dungeons and dragons or risk. And they're, they're padding themselves uh, for how smart they are. Well, the rest of us are out there like doing the actual fighting. Uh, also strategists often are not the actual decision makers or policy makers. Best case, they end up advising the decision makers and politicians, but remember the decision makers don't have to listen to them. Yeah, that's a pretty big deal. The we often get really smart people to help us dig into the we talked about complexity, right? To dig into these complex problems and help identify solutions and courses of actions, but if they can't convey it, it doesn't make much of a difference. They might be super smart, but they have to be able to convey that to us or it doesn't help. And in the eyes of the people on the ground doing the work or managing the problem, Credibility goes a long way when smart people talk or they think about this sort of thing, but that means being able to relate to us, right? On the flip side, if you are that practitioner level and you have those really smart people, but you think you're too cool to listen to them because they're not you, because they're not kicking doors, because they're not the ones kicking ass and taking names. If you're too cool to listen to the smartest people around on a level that maybe is uncomfortable for you or, or out of your league, or if your ego can't handle that, you're doing yourself and the mission a disservice. And I've seen that play out in, in policing recently. And I'll give you a fall on that. If that super smart academic nerd is getting it wrong, walk up to him and tell him. Uh, I, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and be open-minded to the fact that they might understand things on a level that either you're not prepared for, or you don't realize uh, they, they're, they're, you could provide valuable insight, but go into it with an open mind. And if if you're in that big picture realm, if you're thinking about those, con if you are one of those smart people and you're thinking about the grand strategy or the solution to these difficult problems, your theories and your concepts lose a lot of relevance if you can't tell me, the knuckle dragger, what to do about it or what that means, right? What to do differently in light of those things. If you have credibility and I trust you, but you can't tell me how to implement those things in term in the terms and the context that matter where the rubber meets the road, right? Then you're falling short of your task when it comes to expertise that makes you very, very smart, but also a little bit useless to me. So that's the challenge, right? Like bridging that gap is, is important. Yeah. Um, and where strategy stuff often gets the most frustrating for me is when we talk about China, China, so hot right now. <laughs> when any of my friends in national security of the military, especially if they grew up doing counterterrorism stuff, which a lot of us did, when they start getting serious about Indo-PACOM, which is how we describe that region of the world, they start learning and they go through this journey of self-discovery about the situation, the layout of resources, the order of battle, like where the missiles are and the boats and the submarines and the history and they often hit this like cognitive wall uh one way to describe it might be the dunning kruger curve they learn a little bit and have overconfidence about how much they know and they kind of throw up their hands They're like well china thinks long term and strategic and we don't <laughs> we have adhd so china's gonna win <laughs> perfect thanks sun Tzu. Grat you did it <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Uh, you don't get to throw your hands up. If there's one thing that I want you to understand from all of the episodes of Tactical Tangents, it's like you don't get to throw your hands up. You don't get to say, Jesus, take the wheel, or Jesus, Xi Jinping, take the wheel, ever, right? China prides itself. They see themselves as thinking long-term, but that doesn't mean their strategy is any good or that we can't defeat it. But if we declare it's a lost cause before the game even gets interesting, well, that's how we get the loss. So don't be so quick to give up just because, like, supposedly they think long term. That's probably true. But that doesn't mean they're smart or, like, better than we are at this stuff. Like, everyone struggles with this. And I do want to talk China because it is the hotness, especially in the national security world. The, um, the United States and our allies 
and the communist regime in China seem to be kind of on a collision course. We are in competition and tension, and we are at constant risk of escalation. Now, America doesn't want a war, as far as I know. Neither does China, as far as I know. But China wants Taiwan, which is an island off the coast of China that China sees as theirs. Taiwan sees themselves as Taiwan. China also seems to want all the resources in the South China Sea, which is a geographic space about the size of America in international water. And one of the reasons we call it international waters is China doesn't own it. They also seem to want a bulk of the resources in Africa and South America. They also want the ability to influence, coerce, and control people around the world. And we don't want them to do that. That's the collision course. That's the tension, right? Uh, And they have a counter narrative. They have their side of that story. I don't care what their side of the story is (laughs) because I, you know, it's my responsibility to kind of counter it a little bit. But when we look at that tension, it is really tempting to look just at the South China Sea. And we, we Americans tend to look at it like a playing field, like a football field, right? We've got our players. They have their players. Hut, hut, hike. Hey, did a little right up the middle. Okay. It is possible that we will have a big showdown there. But honestly, it's kind of unlikely, right? China would way rather take Taiwan without firing a shot. And we did a whole episode about the, the tension we have with China and Russia. It's worth checking out. So, in this context, let's think strategically about how China could take Taiwan without firing a shot. How do you get Taiwan to bend the knee? How do you deter the U.S. from intervening if you do choose to take Taiwan by force? Is there something China could do that would convince us it ain't worth the lives, it ain't worth the money, it ain't worth the economic hardship? to start World War III. Can you think of any ways China could do that? Because I guarantee there's probably, I don't know, 100,000 Chinese people trying to figure that out right now. So we should probably do some thinking on our own. So to think strategy, like how do I get you, our listeners, our audience to think strategy? Well, I want you to try to think long-term and big picture. I need you to understand competing risks, rewards, and resources. And I also want you to think about communication. (laughs) How do you tell that strategy to your practitioners, your fielded forces, and how do you tell the decision makers so that they're going to actually execute it? How do you get your strategy greenlit? So one thing that is really important in all this is to understand measures of performance and measures of effectiveness, right? Are we doing the things we are trying to do and are those the right things and are they working? Okay. It is really tempting to measure and report stupid shit. The military is awful about this. We love saying like how many bombs we dropped, how many bombs we dropped doesn't matter except to the bomb supply chain. So I can get more bombs, right? But the number of bombs I I delivered to Iraq, how many bombs do you think we delivered to Iraq in the last 20 years? I don't know. There's a lot. A couple. (laughs) A couple. Okay. The number of enemy you kill with those bombs, honestly, doesn't really matter unless you kill enough of them that the survivors stop fighting you. So you got to think of what else can I measure that will tell me that my stuff's actually working. Okay, effort tells me one thing, but it doesn't tell me enough. I need to know results, effects. I need you to understand the difference between operational end state and a theory of success, right? Like, on this mission, what does success look like? But over the long term, understand that, like, success never ends. The game never ends. I have to keep succeeding, okay? Asymmetry is a big thing, right? When one side's big, the other side's small. Um, 
and know that things like brute force might play into the enemy's strategy. And a classic example of this is like if Iran's strategy is to see how much cash we're willing to blow to protect Israel, uh, they could shoot a bunch of cheap drones and cheap ballistic missiles. And we, America, could use our advanced air defenses to shoot all of them down. And in the process, we protect shipping in the Red Sea, we protect Israel, and we spend like a billion dollars a day, a week, a month. And we use up a bunch of those advanced air defense missiles and we expose their capabilities and limitations to the world. And by the way, we might need those advanced air defense missiles later. So we could brute force that Iranian strike. And honestly, it costs Iran very little to make and deliver those drones and those missiles. And they don't even have to put themselves at risk. They let the Houthis do it. Most Americans don't even know what the hell the Houthis are or where they are, and they don't care. Uh, So Iran gets to impose a cost on us, and we impose a cost on the Houthis? Okay, cool. I I don't know if we're winning that equation, right? So with that, understand, like, there's a difference between strength and power. Strength without leverage to coerce your enemy, uh, may hurt your power instead of reinforcing it. That might include weapons you can't or won't use. We might have nuclear bombs, but if we can't use them or we won't use them, that doesn't get us anything, right, in in a particular scenario. There are things I can't buy with money. I could put a $10 million bounty on bin Laden's head, but if no one's going to give him up for 10 mil, it doesn't matter. You also can't buy certain things with the lives of your people. Yep. We did that whole episode on sending people to their deaths, right? Yep. Strategy. Um, and all of this matters at the lower levels, but it matters more as you go up in the ranks, right? So consider as you get more authority over resources and risks, like I need you to think more and more and more about this. It's it's fun to think tactics. I like thinking tactics, but I need you to think about all this other stuff too. Um, when we talk about strategic failures, did we fail in Iraq? I don't know that we really did. Like you could debate that. Did we fail in Afghanistan? Well, man, that last couple of weeks in uh, evacuating Kabul, it felt like a failure. Like I'm, I'm still, I know I spent a huge chunk of my adult life in Afghanistan. I like emotionally, psychologically, I feel like that was a failure. I'm very frustrated by that, but strategically, uh, you, you could make a case either way about how that went. Right. But don't let strategic failures, however you define them or wherever you define them. Uh, don't let that overshadow the importance and pride in how we execute at the tactical level, right? Strategy, strategy, it's going to do its thing. It's this never ending game, right? Um, But when we execute really, really well, that is still a thing we can be proud of. And that's worth knowing and worth remembering and worth reminding your, your guys about. Okay. You cannot think about tactics to the exclusion of strategy, and you can't think about strategy to the exclusion of tactics. And connecting the two is what I would call the operational art. And that, I think, is where a lot of the magic is. It's common, and it's very easy to scoff with, like, we don't have a strategy. Uh, And sometimes that's true. (laughs) We may not have a strategy, but like there probably is a strategy and you just need to go find it. Sometimes it's classified. Okay. Well, if you're the type of person who has access to it, go find it. Okay. And then if you find it, you might have to take that guidance or big picture knowledge and still contextualize it and make sure that you can implement that in a meaningful way. That's relevant to you and your reality. And your people, right? We have a national security strategy. You can go on the White House website right now and read the national security strategy. There are parts of it I like, parts of it I don't, but you should at least know what's in it. There's a national military strategy. There's a whole bunch of other strategic documents because they're what we use to prioritize funding. So you can you can bet we have them. 
Uh, and if you're in the military, like seriously, I want you to go and read them, at least skim them. Uh, if you don't feel like you understand them, start poking your bosses to explain it to you. And if they can't, that's a clue that you have some work to do. And maybe your bosses have some work to do. You need to understand where you fit in the strategy. So what are some takeaways for the guys kicking indoors or flying the planes or putting water on the fire? What are the takeaways? Uh, you need to have a common context. You need to have a common lexicon, common language for how you're talking about this stuff. Knowing the strategic goals and guidelines uh, helps you figure out what immediate short-term problems you need to focus on, where you need to put your resources, what tactics you should be applying to solve them. If you're in a counterinsurgency, hearts and minds is a strategy. And it's different from attrition. <laughs> if you have an attrition strategy, go attrit. If you have a, a hearts and minds strategy, go hearts and minds. You can overlap them. But if you're going to do that, you got to do it on purpose, right? And ha having that gets everyone kind of on the same page about what their role is in the bigger picture. You need to define success. Strategy tells you what the goal is. And as conditions change, you might need to adjust your plans, right? In order to get to the commander's intent. Even as a tactician, knowing the strategic objective helps you figure out what your tactical objectives are and informs your own decision making. And last thing for that is like individual impact. Strategic corporal is a real thing. If you get a chance, go find General Krulak's article about it and understand like every one of us does impact this bigger strategic picture. So there was a lot here in strategy, right? And there is that that is the nature of strategy is there's a lot to it. There's a lot you have to consider. Hopefully, this also helps you get a sense of why it's so tough. As a tactician, I want commander's intent. I want a clear objective. That way, we can harmonize and we can get that good implicit guidance and control. And think about when or if you want strategy to be a secret. Can it even be a secret? Right? If Corporal Snuffy doesn't know what the strategy is, do you trust his blind obedience? Do you trust the entire, entire chain of command to get it right? What happens when that deployed unit commander is cut off from his leadership? He's probably going to execute the tactics he was trained on. Hope that works out. If he doesn't know what the strategy is, he, he may not apply or she may not apply what you want, where you want, how you want. Especially when things change. Yeah. The concept that the strategic game doesn't end, I think, is important and it's helpful, right? There's an end state with a big asterisk. There's an end state for now. Much more of a comma than a period, right? I like that. Yeah. yeah. There is no end state. There's only setting yourself up for more advantage, more resources, less risk, more options with each turn. Uh, in the words of Kenny Rogers, the gambler, the best that you can hope for is to die in your sleep. <laughs> good strategy <laughs> every hand's a winner every hand's a loser uh, I want to give a special shout out to Aaron Haskins and David Lyle uh, they both helped us refine this message and uh, help me really get a much better product for you so thank you to them uh, I think this is important stuff I think this is tough and I think we need to get it right. And I think we as a military, I think we as the law enforcement community, and I think even we as, as civilians interested in defense, we need to understand this stuff uh, because the bad guys do have a strategy. The bad guys do have strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, goals. And I don't want to let them leverage their capabilities against us. I think the the biggest theme that I just want to offer in, in closing in this, and this is something that like we launched to a really high level and Jim put a lot in here. I mean, there's, there's a lot that, I mean, even if you just took a, a, a couple pieces of it and applied it to your reality, it all boils back to two key themes that we've talked about a lot over the years doing this show. One is critical thinking and 
think about the difference between like thinking and critical thinking. Like you need to be, you really need to challenge your assumptions. And that's the second, the second big theme is like, be a critical consumer of information and challenge your assumptions because that, that big picture, right? Like things are going to play out. And do you want to be prepared for that? Or do you want to just be reactive? Like you get to make a choice before, right? When the time to perform arrives, the time to prepare has passed. So I think that's all I got. Uh, be safe out there. Be smart out there. And uh, if you get a chance, check out some of these books. We're, we're putting a lot of links in the show notes. Uh, I don't expect you to memorize all 15 premises. Of oh, Grand's. I do. I do. <laughs> but uh, there will be a quiz. I will distribute that on the. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, we'll send out a sticker so we can recite them all off. I like that. Um, uh, but hopefully, there's a nugget or two in there that you find useful. Yeah. And if you, uh, like I said, go, go find the show notes, go dig into it because this is good stuff. All right. Cheers. All right, guys, that's all we got for tonight. This episode is brought to you by Drip Drop. Drip Drop Oral Rehydration Solution is an electrolyte powder that you mix with water. It was formulated by a doctor for quick absorption. I work in the desert, and it only takes a few hours in the heat, wearing body armor, carrying around a bunch of gear before I start feeling like crap and fall behind the curve in dehydration. Drip Drop keeps you in the fight so you can finish the mission and rehab for the next one. Go get you some at dripdrop.com or on Amazon or ask your supply guy to find it for you. This episode is also brought to you by Zero Nine Holsters. We talk a lot about people, ideas, and hardware on this show. So when we invest in equipment, we always think in terms of experience first. Zero Nine is helping you figure out how to carry the gear you need to be effective. They are built by cops, for cops, with a minimalist design and bomb-proof durability. Radio cases, flashlights, body cameras, even canine remotes, you name it. Zero Nine has been filling a void in tactical duty holsters for more than a decade. Go see what they offer at Zero Nine Holsters. That's Z-E-R-O, the number nine, holsters.com. Zero Nine, built to win the fight. Don't forget that we put out new episodes on the 1st and the 15th of every month. If you like what we're doing, you can have our Patreon. Give us a buck for each new episode. That money's going to go back into bringing you good content. If you want to interact with us, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We are at TacTangents. You can also email info at tacticaltangents.com. And one last thing, our uh, Facebook discussion group. We've got a little group going on Facebook. If you go to the groups tab on our page, you can join it. Um, we've got more followers on our page than we have in the group. So I know there's some of you out there following the Facebook page that are on Facebook that are not in the group. Lots of like-minded people in there. Uh, so come hang out with us. Uh, all right. That's all we got. Good talk.